Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Effed Up Stories. I'm your host, Will Pender. And I'm your co-host, Ryan Sharp. And tonight we'll be talking about the strange deaths and disappearances involving nine Russian uh, hikers and skiers who were found dead with extremely strange details that suggest it could have been caused by extraterrestrials, yetis, ghosts, or even beyond. But before we get into that, a uh, couple noteworthy things that we want to point out. Um, first of all, we actually did this podcast before. It was one of our favorites. Uh, we did it around last summer, and it disappeared, ironically. Uh, so we always hoped that we'd come back and uh, and redo it, and that's what we're doing here. Um but before we get into any of that, uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of updates and stuff like that that uh, has been done to our uh, official site. If you um, have been there, it's effedupstories.com. That's E-F-F-E-D-U-P-S-T-O-R-I-E-S dot com. Uh, even though it might not look extremely different on the surface, uh, I did make major changes to it structurally, so... What that means for you right now is that you can actually browse the site on a, uh, a tablet or a, uh, a smartphone and, of course, laptops and desktops. Um, there's no more flash with the exception of the YouTube embeds of these episodes, but uh, any modern um, mobile device usually has like a YouTube app built in. So while it might not display like your traditional flash menus and stuff, it will actually play these videos, and of course, it'll make all the updates and, and future expansions uh, to the site infinitely easier to do. Uh, some of the other things um, that we've been, I guess, discussing over the, the past couple months is we've been getting um, lots of requests from our fans, you guys, on things that you'd like to have improved on our show and, uh, uh, you know, we, we've really come to understand that the, uh, the focal point of our site has become our podcast, uh, you know, and, and the site's kind of been uh, changed to reflect that as well. And so the past couple of months, Ryan and I, and, uh, bleh, Ryan and I have been discussing um, how to get some of these uh, uh, requests in that you, you know, you guys have wanted, like some of you have asked for uh, video in our podcast, and you know, uh, er, we've had a, a great outpouring of, of um, you know, uh, people liking that we've had uh, some notable guests on our show. So far, we've had, uh, you know, Chris O'Brien, uh, who was the first international investigator on uh, the Skinwalker Ranch, and we've had Jason Haxton of the Dybbuk Box uh, fame. And so, you know, and we have a couple other things lined up. Um, not that we really want to give away the details yet, but uh, we've been discussing all these different things and how we can give you more of what you like. And so what we've essentially come down with is that in order to give you, uh, like in order to get more of these uh, notable guests and, and just more content, more everything that you like, we need this show we need to build on its audience. And right now, we're, we're especially thankful. I mean, we, we've broke 40,000 views. Um, we're about to hit 200 subscribers. Um, so there's, there's been substantial snowballing going on in, in the past couple months. And uh, basically, what it all comes down to, if you want more high-caliber guests, more submitted content, more of everything, our audience needs to bigger, be bigger. So we thought, What's the quickest way that we can do that? And the quickest way that we can do that is to advertise and promote our videos, um, specifically to our target audience, which we know who you are, thanks to the analytical information. Um, so here, here's our dilemma. You know, we're, we're two guys. I mean, we don't mind doing the work. We, uh, you know, and investing our, our own money, Ryan went out and spent like, I think it was at least $300 or more on a, a new microphone to improve his audio quality on the podcast. And I myself will be dropping another $150 on the, the web hosting um, wall right after Christmas. Uh, so there's only so much that we can do in that regards. If you guys want to help us out, I've set up a donation form 
on the official website. It's just uh, if you go to our official website at fdupstories.com, that's e f f e d u p s t o r i e s dot com. You scroll down a little bit, and on the right side, you'll see a little button that says donate. It'll take you to PayPal, which I'm sure you've heard of before. It's a safe and secure way to, uh, you know, have online transactions. And whether you want to donate fifty cents, ten cents, ten dollars, it it really doesn't matter. All the money that gets donated will be funneled back into our podcast in one shape or another. And so, really, the the ball is in your court, people. I mean, we don't mind doing the work, but we, you know, like most people, we're limited on funds. So. If you want to see us really take this to the next level, come out and help us do it. Uh, other ways that you can help if you don't want to donate is just to, you know, if you're not subscribed to our channel, subscribe. Uh, you know, spread the word. Tell your friends, your family to subscribe. Anywhere you frequent on the internet, whether it's forums or blogs, you know, drop our name. Drop links to our videos. Uh, uh, you know, embed our videos. You know, just spread it everywhere because the more people that you know comes on. The bigger our audience is, the more likely that interesting guests will want to be on our show. The more stuff we'll get. In the end, is the more stuff we'll be able to give to you. And for those of you who have already been doing this, subscribing, dropping comments, sending us emails, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, our, our audience is... The only reason why we do this, if if people weren't interested, um, you know, we wouldn't bother. Uh, and your your comments and your support, uh, your subscriptions and your views are all very very much appreciated. And uh, with that said, let's let's get to the uh, the meat of this episode. So what we're talking about is the what is it the diet diet love pass incident now. I, I'm going to apologize up front that I'm going to pronounce a lot of stuff wrong because it comes over from Russian. Um, yeah, I believe they, yeah, I believe the, because uh, I, I actually looked up the pronunciation of it and I think it's pronounced Ditlov. Ditlov, okay. So it's the yeah. Ditlov Pass incident. And of course, uh, you know, what it consists of, we're talking about nine very experienced skiers and hikers that, you know, Ex- extremely suspicious and and just off the wall crazy uh, disappearances and findings regarding these people, and I, I'm gonna name off a source here because I I found it to be uh, very very well fleshed out. Uh, I I this is one of the many sources that I use for this. But again, if you guys want to just go and really dig into this thing, I mean it's very it's fairly substantial. And you can find uh, uh, the article at http colon forward slash forward slash www dot e r m a k travel dot com, and from there you just navigate until you uh, you find the story. So anyway, um, basically this story takes place back in the nineteen fifties. Um, and these hikers were, were hiking in the Ural Mountains, and this is all in Russia. And uh, I'm just going to name off the, uh, the, the member names. Now, keep in mind, the, the group was actually made of 10 members. Um, one of them didn't go on this trip, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, first we have Igor uh, Aleskievich uh, Ditloff. Is that, is that right, Ryan? Do you have your notes there? I most certainly do. Uh, I, I think you should pronounce these because I don't think I can do it. I believe we have uh, Igor Aleskovich, um, Zenidia uh, Leskovinia, um, Ludmila Alekstrovnava, uh, Alexander uh, Sirgovich, Rustam Veldomrothovich, Yuri uh, Aleksevich um, Kronosko uh, Krenko, Yuri Nikolovich Doreshkino, uh, Nikolai uh, Vladimirovich, um, Alexander Alexandrovich uh, Zolarovti, and Yuri Yevermov, uh, Yevermovich Yedin. Yudin. Yudin. Sorry. <laughs> Close. Oh, geez, man. You did pretty good. Like, I was looking at that, and it just looked like someone pounded on the keyboard. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, 
it, you know, I'm going to mess up my pronunciation a lot, I think, with this, but uh, thankfully we won't really have to say the names very much. Um, so anyway, this is the team of 10 people, and, you know, I mean, their whole goal, um, you know, they, they went to this, this um, the the mountains in, in the Urals of, of Jesus, Skurskalaska Oblasta, <laughs> you know, so, something like that. Anyway, it, it was led by... Skurdvast Oblast. There you go. And it, it was led by Iger Ditloff. Uh, so he was the leader of the group. Uh, the group consisted of eight men, two women, and their goal was to get to Otertan, which is a specific mountain on the north side of the east shoulder. Um, anyway, so, you know, they all hopped on a train, and they went to the city of Ivdel, and then they took a truck to Vizhai, and uh, this was the, the last inhabited settlement, you know, that was extremely far north, and, you know, basically this is where they started their expedition. So, you know, as I said, these are experienced, very experienced skiers and hikers. You know, they have went on several marathons uh, of, of this nature before and, and, and hiking and stuff like that. So, you know, um, they were very qualified uh, to make this trip. So anyway, they, they started this expedition on January 27th as a group of 10. But the lucky, lucky man, Yuri Yudin, uh, he got sick. And so he had to go back. So from that point on, we have the infamous nine that went onwards, and uh, our lucky survivor <laughs> was uh, Yuri Yudin. So I'm pretty sure he's pretty glad he uh, he got sick. So you know, keep in mind that uh, there wasn't really any live witnesses to say what happened. There's a couple of witnesses for a certain thing that we'll get to near the end, but you know, the remainder of this story is is what was made up of. Um, you know, basically when search groups went out, they found the group's diaries and they found uh, cameras and, uh, uh, you know, they, they, of course, they, they spoke to Yuri Yudin after the fact. So but I don't, I don't believe there was any, uh, I don't think there was anything useful in the diaries. I, I think most of the story is, is, is constructed. Uh, From what they what, found. Yeah, just the, 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 just let the, that bizarre crime scene, uh, um, you know, speak to them. And uh, boy, that did it have volumes. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll save that for last just to say that it, it I think it, it's the highlight of this this whole thing. The whole thing turns on its head when we get to that point. So, you know, it, it, it's the 31st of January when the group finally reaches the highland area and they start climbing, you know. And once they get up there, you know, they reach a wooded valley and they, they prepare a station with supplies for their trip back. You know, it, it consisted of food, equipment, and, uh, you know, these kinds of things. So anyway... You know, the next day they start making their way up to the pass. And, you know, from all indications, it seemed uh, that they intended to get over the pass that day and, you know, set up camp the next night on the other side. But unfortunately, you know, the, the weather just gets crazy. You know, uh, it, we're talking about Siberia, so it's already we already know it's full of snow and it's cold. But, you know, they start getting these crazy snowstorms. Uh, there's, you know, their vision is severely reduced and you know by all accounts they ended up losing their sense of direction and drifted west towards the uh, the top of the east shoulder um which i should mention is tagged the mountain of death so uh, <laughs> you know how comfortable would you be ryan like hiking up this place uh and then landing in a place that's called the mountain of death uh, you know, it, it's it's funny that a lot of these mountains and and valleys and regions that you look at that have you know these names attached to them. There's there's typically a reason why it's called the Mountain of Death. Well, that, that's um, my thought. It's like, well, what happened here before they call it the Mountain of Death? Like, do you really want to go hiking? I mean, here's a place that's out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, they they reached the last settlement where there's people at all. Right, so I mean, what would you do in an emergency like that? Like, what do they have down there? I mean, f by the sounds of it, it, it wasn't a very big settlement. What if someone got hurt? Like, who would you call? I mean, it's not like they had cell phones back then. Personally, I'd be a little bit freaked out at, of the isolation 
And well, obviously, we have a, a group of young uh, adrenaline junkies. Uh, perhaps they're 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 confident in their own abilities. And well, uh, I guess they are. They are experienced. You know, but still, like, you know, here here's the mountain of death. You know, uh, had to get its name. Uh, I don't know. You, but you, hey. <laughs> and it's interesting that a lot of the times it's not just well there was an avalanche and it killed a lot of people it's well the you know the natives in this area say there's evil spirits that live in the mountain so they call it uh, the devil's mountain or the mountain of death or yeah uh, so you know so I mean this is where they end up going unintentionally like they didn't really intend to head in this direction but because of the weather. And, uh, you know, and this kind of thing. I mean, they, they lose direction and they end up in the mountain of, you know, next to the mountain of death. This, this cold, lonely shoulder on this mountain. So, you know, at some point during this, this chaotic travel, uh, you know, they realize, hey, you know, this is the wrong direction. They knew it was getting dark and that they were going to have to set up camp, you know. So... It said that the the uh, there was a forested area, I believe, like about uh, 1.5 kilometers downhill from where they were, and you know, with the storm, you know, I mean, wouldn't you agree? It would make sense that you know, I'm not going to stay on the face of this thing where we're getting pummeled with snow and 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 wind, but let's go down to the to the. Well, you get to the tree line, and you got a wind break, and you 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 know, you have some features to keep the weather off of you. You know, so it's definitely a smart move. Go down the mountain is always a, a a better direction when there's a storm. Yeah, and you know that was my impression as well. But uh, you know that's not what happened. You know, like uh, they actually got a, you know, Yuri Yudin, which is the guy who went home sick. They got his opinion on what he thought happened because I mean they they just set up camp here on on this bare section. Of the mountain, you know. So I mean, you're they were still getting pummeled. I mean, yeah, you're in a tent, but how safe would you feel in a tent with winds like that, right? It'd probably blow you right off the mountain. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they got his opinion, your Uden's opinion, and he said, uh, you know, and I quote, Ditloff probably didn't want to lose the altitude that they had gained." Or he, you know, decided to practice camping on the mountain slope. So, you know, for whatever reason, um. You know, as bad of an idea as it sounds, they decide to just screw it. They're going to camp on this barefaced mountain at the time. You know, so part of the plan uh, I should mention in this entire trip was that Ditloff was, you know, once he they got up and back on this trip, you know, he was going to send a, you know, once he get back to his uh, to the the settlement where they left off from, he was going to send a telegraph to their sports club. Um, and, uh, you know, once they got back to Viz High. So uh, if you remember, um, uh, yeah, that, that, that was the settlement, right? Yes. Yeah. So anyway, you know, it was assumed that that would happen by the latest would be February 12th. Um, but you know, due to the nature of these kinds of expeditions, um, it is considered common to take a little longer. Uh, however, it went on uh, quite a bit longer, I think, than, than anybody thought. So, you know, the relatives of the team were obviously worried, and they demanded a rescue operation. So, you know, the, the first rescue group that was uh, sent out was made up of uh, student volunteers and students, or, uh, and teachers, sorry, students, student volunteers and teachers. And, uh, you know, they actually got out there on the, the February 20th, and not long after that, uh, you know, a more substantial search and rescue team made up of the Army and police uh, police force were sent out on the case, and they used planes and helicopters to assist in the effort. Um, but it wasn't until on February 26th that they actually found anything. And I think you'll agree that what they found raised more questions than answers. Um, <laughs> basically, the first thing they come across is the group's tent. Okay, so this is still set up on the shoulder, you know, the, the mountain of death out in the middle of, the, uh, you know, nothing to protect it from the winds. A spur of rocks sticking up into the cold Russian sky. Yeah, basically. And, you know, the it was badly damaged. It was half torn down and covered in snow. 
And, uh, you know, this is where it gets really strange is that all the group's belongings and shoes were left behind. Uh, you know, the, the tent had been uh, cut open. And this, this is where it's really fascinating. Investigators, you know, they, I mean, they, they picked apart all this stuff. And the tent was cut open from the inside as if there was like a, a mad rush to get the hell out of there. You know, like, uh, I mean, what would happen that was so dramatic that you cut yourself out from the inside? Like, you couldn't use the door? Like, that's that's a, an erratic... Uh, I mean, w- wouldn't you think that to be like, holy shit, what just happened? Well, it, it, it's certainly, uh, uh, again, it's, you know, like I said, it's, it speaks volumes as to the the psychological state of the people inside of those tents. I mean, you, you imagine you're camping on the side of a mountain in a tent, and, you know, well, the imagination just runs wild with possibilities of, now, what would possibly spur you into the act of, pulling out your knife from wherever you have it where and we're guessing you know you're out in the woods you got probably got a knife on your hip uh and just start slashing wildly at your your tent to uh, to try to get out rather than uh walk over unzip the front unbuckle the front uh untie it or whatever the case may be and uh and you know, step they, out yeah and they, they i mean they leave their stuff behind and i mean to to add further to the the chaos of the scene here is that we have uh, uh, you know footprints, you know from from all indications about like from what appear to be eight different sets of footprints all around this thing, and you know uh, they're made up of what appear to be uh, people's people in bare feet, sock feet, or like a single shoe, you know like basically some people were wearing stuff, some people weren't. I mean it was just a mad dash to get out right now. And, you know, the tracks actually led down to the woods, uh, you know, the, the, where we said they should have set up camp. It was 1.5 kilometers away. I mean, that's where these, these uh, footprints went towards, you know. And once uh, the, the uh, search and rescue teams got down to the tree line, you know, investigators found uh, the remains of a fire near, like, a, a big cedar tree. And this is where they found the first two bodies of the members of the group. And, you know, here they were, they were in their underwear, they weren't wearing shoes. Um, You know, all things uh, considered, it's hard to imagine uh, they were the ones that even had the fire. Uh, You know, if in fact they showed up there with nothing on, but I I don't think that's what happened. (laughs) Um, It also appears if, like, uh, one of the two of the the people that were found there uh, had climbed uh, one of the trees next to them, uh, perhaps the the, uh, the big cedar because, you know, it was noted that the branches had been cracked off up to five meters high, and there was uh, blood and, and stuff like that found in the um, in the bark and uh, and some of the branches and stuff like that, and uh, it, it led you know investigators to speculate that maybe they were trying to get some kind of a viewpoint or or something you know uh, from you know, higher up on a tree or something like that. So, I mean, uh, I it guess... It certainly paints a, uh, a desperate picture. Uh, you know, a few uh, almost naked men huddled next to a fire beneath a, 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 a tall tree on the side of a mountain. Um, you know, yeah, and again... It, it's like, what no... were they running from, right? Exactly. Like I, I exactly. mean, what, what happened that, I mean... You know, in, in Siberia, I mean, come on, it's, it's freezing, and you're going to leave all your stuff behind. You, I mean, you got to be desperate just to leave that behind and run out in the snow like that. I, I mean, what possibly could have spooked them uh, to do this? So, I mean, this is the first two bodies they find, and uh, you know, the, the you know they the first body, of course, was uh, Yuri Dorsh, Dorshinko, and uh, anyway, uh, these are. From the medical autopsy notes, okay, so uh, the autopsy on this person, uh, you know, and and these are in jot note form, uh, the ear and the nose and lips are covered by blood, Uh, the right armpit has a bruise about 2 centimeters uh, by 1.5, inner surface of the right shoulder has 2 abrasions, 2 centimeters by 1.5 centimeters with no bleeding in the tissues uh, and 2 cuts on the skin. 
the upper third of uh, right forearm brown, uh, red bruises with size 4 by 1 centimeter, 2.5 by 1.5 centimeter, and 5.5 centimeters. Uh, fingers on both hands have torn skin. Bruises, uh, bruised skin in the upper third of both legs. Uh, signs of frostbite on face and ears. Uh, on the right cheek, foamy gray fluid discharges from the mouth. Um, you know, from all indications, though, I mean, the, the cause of death was said to be hypothermia, and that does make sense. But it also indicates that there was a struggle. Right, I mean, we we have all these bruises and 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 you know stuff like that. I mean, there there was so, again like it, it just paints the picture again with uh, you know it, it goes hand in hand with the the, the chaos that must have been shooed from the tent. Uh, and the next body that was there with that one was uh, George Yuri Krivanschenko. Um, in any case. Uh, you know, he had bruises on his forehead, uh, bruises around his left temporal bone, uh, diffuse bleeding in the right temporal and occupable region due to damage to temporalis muscle. Uh, the tip of his nose was missing, uh, frostbitten ears, uh, bruises on the right side of the chest, uh, bruises on the hand, detachment of the epidermis on the back of his left hand at the width of 2 centimeters. A uh, portion of the epidermis from the right hand is found in the mouth of the deceased. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> some, some of his own uh, uh, skin was found in his own mouth from no, his it, hand. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, for a second I thought it was the other guy, but yeah, yeah a, por <laughs> a portion of his own skin was found in his mouth. Um, yeah. That's, yeah, I guess he must have been delirious. Um, <laughs> so uh, he also had bruises on his thighs with minor scratches, bruise on his left buttocks, abrasions on the other side, the left, um, other side, the left size, uh, that seems like a typo, bruises on the left leg, and a burn on the left leg, I, I'm assuming from the fire. So, uh, you know, and again, the cause of death here was suggested um, that it was hypothermia, but still... Um, you know, I mean, we have some really strange, uh, you know, all indications of, of you know, uh, some kind of struggle, a physical struggle, right? I mean, they didn't just calmly walk down to the cedar uh, tree in the woods, uh, you know, it, it, they got hurt from something, right? So they were either scrambling, banging into shit, or, you know, they were... Um, you know, perhaps fighting each other or fighting off something. Well, there, there, it, it, every indication that there was some some great violent activity that had taken place. You know, a mad scramble uh, into the into the cold darkness. Um, you know, they they're they're covered in cuts and contusions and abrasions, bruises. Uh, it, it it certainly does bespe bespeak a very uh, violent scene um and again this is just uh this is just the first two we're just getting just started too yeah so i mean between there and the in the camp uh you know three more bodies were found in poses which suggested that they were trying to return to their tent and of course we have the autopsy reports for those two so uh first we have zaneda kalmagorava zanada no sorry Z zaneda kalmagorava uh, anyway, she she was much uh, better dressed than the uh, the other ones, um, and what you'll find from here on out is that you know many of these uh, uh, th the rest of these bodies were found to be wearing clothes uh, which belonged to the, the the other further back members, which um, you know suggests to me and and others that you know either they took them after they died. You know, which you would do. I mean, if you're freezing out there, and you know, uh, you or, know, or at least and uh, once they went unconscious. Yeah, you know. So I mean, they <laughs> they took this uh, to survive. Um, but I mean, considering the the bruises and stuff, one has to wonder if they they, they got into a fight of fisticuffs uh, <laughs> to ensure their survivals. You know, like to to get their uh, their clothes or whatever. Um, so, anyways, you know, she, this one is, is fairly uh, um, dressed well, 
but she had uh, you know frostbites on the phalanges of the fingers, numerous bruises on the hands and palms, uh, a long bruise that encircled her on the right side. Um, and you know they again we have a, a case of, of hypothermia. Um, so so far, I mean, it, it's sounding pretty typical for what you'd expect uh, out in the uh, you know for someone to to like what you're you're what you died of, I guess we'll say. It makes sense that yeah, you died of hypothermia out in this place. Um, so I mean, after that, we have the uh, the group leader Igor Ditloff. Uh, he was the next one found, and uh, you know, his head was bare. Um, you know, he you know he still had like a, a a fur coat, although it was said to be unbuttoned. Long sleeve shirt, ski pants over his pants. Um, his footwear was absent, though. So, you know, I don't know if if someone took it or, you know, he was one of the ones that just ran off out of there barefoot. Um, he had a. Uh, uh, you know, minor abrasions on his forehead, abrasions above the left eyebrow of brown-red color, brown-red abrasions on both cheeks, and dried uh, blood on his lips. Um, his lower jaw had a missing incisor. The mucosa was intact that suggested the tooth was uh, lost long before the final trip. So, you know, damage already done. On the lower third of his right forearm and palm surface, many skull, uh, small scratches of red of dark red colorization. Metacar... Oh, geez, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> Are you looking at this? Can you pronounce that for me? Oh, geez. Uh, metacarpal... Uh, the popolangual? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is what doctors do in university. Metacarpal phalangeal. <laughs> anyway, uh, whatever the word is, uh, the joints on his right hand... Um, had brown red bruises. Uh, this is a common injury in hand to hand fights. Again, going with uh, signs of a struggle, you know, uh, perhaps to get clothes or something like that. Um, you know, to get a better idea of the injuries, you know, just make a fist is what is suggested here. Uh, this is part of the hand that you use to hit somebody. So I'm thinking knuckles, personally, if it's something that you use to hit someone with, but. Who knows? Um, he had brownish purple bruises on the left hand and also superficial uh, wounds on the second and fifth finger, bruised knees without bleeding into the underlying tissues, on the lower third of the right leg, bruising, and uh, both ankles had abrasions, uh, bright red, and uh, hemorrhage lying into the underlying tissue. Um, so, you know, again... Uh, it suggested that uh, you know uh, D- Ditloff had died from hypothermia, and we have one more case here of, of the first five, and this is uh, Rustum Slobodin. Uh, you know, Rustin, uh, 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 he had one boot on one uh, his right leg, I believe. Uh, he also had uh, minor brownish red abrasions on his forehead. Uh, two scratches, brownish red bruise on his upper eyelid of the right eye with hemorrhage into the underlying tissues, traces of blood discharge from the nose, swollen lips, swelling, and a lot of small abrasions of irregular shape on the right half of his face. Uh, so, again, you know, uh, uh, in, in this case, I mean, we're looking at um, uh, the cause of death still ended up being, you know, a... a, a, a Screw my loss of thought. Hypothermia. Hypothermia. You know, he, oh yeah, and he had his epider, uh, epidermis torn from his right forearm, which is interesting. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, and, and interestingly enough, he had bruises on those same hand muscles that go with uh, hand-to-hand combat, uh, which almost asks, you know, asks the question whether or not him and, and Ditloff had, had gotten to a, a fight, basically. Well, it's a common injury for I think the last two knuckles, your pinky knuckle and your your ring finger, I guess they call it. Um, that the 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 muscles and tissues connecting those knuckles to your hand actually become detached uh, during uh, 
such uh, pugilist activity, uh, fist fights and whatnot. Uh, when you're straight punching somebody, you you can detach your last two knuckles. So that's perhaps what they're they're speaking about. Uh, it's a you know a common bare knuckle fighters yeah, injury. Uh, yeah, well, so it would be a pretty strong indication that there was some kind of physical altercation between the members. Yeah, like it, it suggests to me that uh, you know perhaps they were they were fighting over clothing, or maybe uh, you know the the other guy was just really mad at Dit- Ditloff for getting them. You know, maybe he never wanted to. You know, camping on that face of the mountain wasn't a bright idea. Maybe it was his idea, as uh, Yuri Uden had suggested. And, you know, the other guy could have been like, you know, this is all your fault kind of thing. Um, but anyway, we're, we're, we're going on to the last four now. And this is, our, you know, by far the strangest four of the, of the whole tale. It really turns the whole story on its head. Because up um, until this point, um, they were pretty, pretty sure that it was, it was rather relatively mundane, that perhaps it was a, a, a small avalanche that caught them on awares. Um, you know, basically, it, like, I mean, up to this point, the only thing that we had that's strange is uh, the means by which, you know, it appeared that they had scrambled out of their tent and left their stuff behind, you know, half-dressed, cutting the tent from the inside out. So we have, a, a like, a trigger, something that caused them to take off out of their tent. That's the only thing suspicious right now because their causes of death are not suspicious yet, right? Yeah. So, so we have the, the remaining four bodies now, and I mean, these bodies took two months to find, uh, but they easily had the strangest implications to attach to them, right? So, first of all, you know, the first five bodies are hypothermia, where these remaining four were fatal injuries, uh, and... Let's let's just dig into that now. These are not natural, or or what you'd expect for people lost uh, in the Siberian snow either. So we have Ludmila Dobanina. Uh, you know, when they found uh, 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 this person, you know, uh, again we had clothes on this person, but uh, you know, apparently there was an external pair of clothes that was damaged by fire and uh, ripped. Uh, she also wore a small hat and and you know two pairs of warm socks. Uh, you know anyway, uh, this is this is probably one of the strangest ones to me. Okay, and I'm gonna say the strangest part last. So, the soft tissues are missing around the eyes and eyebrows and left temporal area. Bone is partially exposed. The eyes were missing. Nose cartilage is broken and flattened. Two, three, four, five ribs are broken on the right side. Two fracture lines are visible. Two, three, four, five, six, seven ribs are broken on the right side. Two fracture lines are visible. Soft tissues of the upper lip are missing. Teeth and upper jaws exposed. Massive hemorrhage in the heart's right atrium. Bruise in the middle left thigh. And damaged uh, tissues around the left temporal bone. And get this now. Her tongue is missing. Her tongue was removed. And... If I uh, if I remember correctly, the doctor that actually had done these autopsies had uh, because two of these four, uh, this is one of them as you can see by the ribs that were broken, uh, you know the and there's another person again with severe chest injuries, you know the doctor suggested that the force by which would have had to have been uh, exerted to have this kind of an injury would have been. Uh, 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 similar to getting hit by a car. Now, what the hell could hit you like that up in the middle of nowhere on a mountain? You know, a, f- a force of a car. Think about that for a second. So, I mean, <laughs> I I have no words to explain. Uh, you know what? What? Well, basically, you have somebody who's who's experienced some severe physical trauma. Uh, you know, trauma that, that we typically associate with uh, high-speed mechanical uh, uh, trauma that is typically not seen in nature. Um, you know, uh, unless a, a rock had tumbled down and, and, and crashed into her. But again, there was never any indication of anything like that. 
No, and like, and I mean, you'll get conflicting reports. I mean, these are the autopsy reports, but, you know, and a couple of the other sources I found, I mean, as you can see, like her eyes were missing and, and some tissues and stuff like that, but there are other uh, sources I've read and, you know, I, I don't know if maybe they were re- referring to only the chest area, uh, but, you know, for at least these sources said that, you know, there was no I- exposed uh, uh blood or, or 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 open incisions um you know so and and that like it's just like she was crushed inside only now obviously i i think i take uh more i think there's more to the the autopsy view of it uh but still um it's something that you'll find if you go looking and, uh, you know, another interesting little tidbit here is that her stomach contained about 100 grams of uh, coagulated blood. And, you know, some people say that that is an indication that the heart was still beating and the when blood the was flowing. Yeah, the, the blood tongue was removed, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that that's that's creepy. Well, you have some very major, you know, uh, or, or say major, but you have some large veins uh, in your tongue. And uh, yeah, if it was removed like that, you'd, you'd have a, uh, you'd be probably be in, in, in danger of uh, perhaps bleeding to death. Um, I could imagine there'd be quite a lot of blood in your mouth. Yeah. And like, uh, uh, you know, these bodies, by the way, were not found uh, together you know, uh, next to one another, dis- despite the, um, you know, the the injuries, even if some are similar. I mean, the first two under the cedar tree was, uh, the, the the next three were were spaced out, um, you know, at least by a couple hundred meters. And again, you know, for these last four, you know, they, they were not next to one another, apparently. So, you know, the next member we have, and I... Again, uh, I guess this makes sense because is Russian. It, it wouldn't mean or sound the same, but his name was uh, Siemens <laughs> Zolterev. Uh, and it, it's spelled, yeah, like semen. But anyway, uh, you know, he was found and he, he was dressed uh, apparently like, I mean, for all intents and purposes, he should have been warm, you know. Uh, and, uh, he had uh, four cameras, I, I believe, um found around his uh uh, tent or whatever (coughs) but um anyway uh interestingly enough again with this guy i mean his eyeballs are missing uh he was missing soft tissues around the left eye uh and and this is the other the other member that had the uh the chest injuries uh uh, you know comparable to getting hit by a car he had a Flare chest, uh, broken, two, three, four, five, and six ribs on the right side, two fracture lines, uh, open wound on the right side with bone exposed. Um, you know, and uh, if you look on the internet, I mean, there's actually pictures of this too, right? I mean, it's pretty creepy looking. Um, and you know, something I just want to point out, you know, with, with these missing eyeballs and like a missing tongue and stuff like that, is that this stuff you know, sounds more like what you, you get with cattle mutilations, right? I mean, it doesn't sound like something that happens to people. Uh, you, do you know what I mean? And, and again, this theory will make more sense when we get to the uh, the end of this. Well, you know, and, and that you point out, um, and I came across this myself, that several sources state that um, you know, oh well, uh, the the tongue and and parts of the lower jaw were 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 missing, um, and that was a, a result of decomposition. Um, you know, but we're talking about a a pretty pretty frozen area. Uh, you, you know, you're not looking at normal uh, decomposition. Now you're looking uh, and, at like mummified. It's like it's like sticking a steak in the fridge. Yeah. Right. And, and and you 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 get a more more freeze dry action happening. Uh, there you know there's and 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 nowhere in any of the autopsy reports did you know did it talk about advanced decay. No. Um, you know and and that's that's what some of the sources report. I don't know where they're getting it from, but from you know these autopsy reports I'm looking at, there there's nowhere it, it doesn't say. Uh, you know, advanced decay, and in fact, the you know, like you stated earlier, uh, at least some of these injuries uh, seem to have been uh, uh, you know pre-mortem injuries. Uh, 
uh, injuries sustained while the subject was still alive. Yeah, and like, and that's why I used these, uh, uh, you know, the autopsy reports as a source because it's a hell of a lot more detailed than what you find with most stuff if you go looking for answers. Uh, a lot of it is very summarized, and um, you know, just just you know, here's a summarized version, and the details kind of differ. But I mean, this is again a lot more detailed, and uh, you know, if, if these are in fact the real autopsy reports, then I, I think you can read these and kind of draw your own conclusions to some extent, right? So uh, moving on now to the third of the the remaining four. Uh, members to be found is uh, Alexander Kolotov and uh, he had uh, a lack of soft tissues around his eyes, eyebrows again are missing uh, skull bones are exposed he had a broken nose open wound behind ear and a deformed neck which is interesting uh, and then we move on to the uh, the last uh, member of the team, uh, Nikolay uh, Thibiu Brig Brignall um, this person had multiple fractures to the temporal bone with extensions uh, to the frontal and, and sphenoid bones. Uh, the close-up of the fractures to the skull is uh, shown on a diagram I'm looking at here. And of course you can't see that, but uh, it's interesting nonetheless. Perhaps we'll post it up on the site if we can. Yeah, if we can. If we can get permission. <laughs> Put yeah. a link up there. Yeah, well, certainly you can check out that link that I mentioned earlier. It has all the pictures there. Uh, you know, there's a, a bruise on the upper, light, uh, upper lip on the left side and hemorrhage in the lower forearm. Um, you know, and I guess one of the strangest details of, you know, all of this, all of these victims, you know, you know as we said, like, uh, there's been an exchange, whether uh, forcibly or voluntarily, of clothes, and... You know these. Well, before before we even jump like right onto the clothes, you know, I, I, we just take a quick overview of, of all those injuries. I mean, I, I, at the very least, um, it paints a picture that you know these people were were exposed to uh, what appears to be some pretty serious, at least kinetic force, uh, in in some way, shape, and form. Uh, you know, you think of the force that's required to crush somebody's chest cavity. Uh, uh, um, it, it, the force is required to crush somebody's skull. Um, I, I mean, I, I've read one report that said that an individual uh, for the the lar for that uh, the, uh, the one gentleman who had his skull fractured, uh, like the serious fracture, um, that it would have taken a fall of uh, eight to ten feet um, to have fractured a skull like that, but without breaking uh, parts of the neck and, and the base of the skull. Uh, but but it could have been no higher than than eight or ten feet, um, you know. So there's there's all these indications of a, a, a just a, a really phenomenal amount of force applied on all of these different people. Um, well, at least in, the last four, right? I mean, here's what we got. I mean, if if we're just gonna uh, summarize what we have here, I mean, we got nine highly skilled hikers and skiers, right? They're up in the middle of nowhere in this mountain. Uh, you know, they they set up camp on a fairly open plain in, in the middle of a snowstorm. And something causes them to jump up in the middle of the night, cut open the tent, leave, you know, some of their, their belongings behind. And they just take off, you know, down towards the forest, uh, you know, whether they wear shoes or not. And then we got two bodies show up. You know, and, and there's signs of a struggle, but, you know, they died of hypothermia. Then we find, you know, three other people, and they're spaced out along this, this track, right, from the camp to the to forest, uh, probably, you know, 100 meters or so apart. And again, you know, these people are wearing uh, clothes of each other's, and there's signs, again, of, of a physical altercation between uh, the group leader and someone else. Uh, but again, you know, you know, despite the the uh, uh, you know the the physical trauma indicated, uh, you know, they're, they're no, yeah, they're, they're they're dead of hypothermia. Yes. And then we get to the remaining four, right? And these these ones are found much later, uh, farther away. And you know what we have here is truly bizarre. We have, you know, 
two people with their chest cavities completely caved in by a force, uh, you know, that would it would take a car to do in a place where no car could be, and we have one person with a fractured skull, like as as you said, would take an extreme amount of force to do the damage that was done, and we have. You know, one uh, one of the members missing her tongue for God's sakes. We, we you know, two people or three people are missing their eyeballs. Uh, you know, again, like all looking like cattle mutilations. Um, in retrospect, I mean, you know, by the way that that they're uh, they're cut. I mean, they're they're in a place that's freezing. It's like sticking a steak in a freezer. So decomp uh, decomposition, for all intents and purposes, uh, wouldn't react the same. You know, I mean, it's frozen right? It's not going to break down quite the same. In fact, I would think they would stay quite preserved, you know, even for those two months. Um, you know, and, and I guess, uh, so, I mean, this is what we're looking at now. I mean, it's just the middle of the blue. There's something terrifying, and I can only assume that whatever terrified them to leave is what attacked them, right? Whatever, whatever it was, uh, I mean that's what I'm left to assume, right? And and if that's the case, then uh, what the, the hell is it? <laughs> well, then then the the little piece of evidence that we we find embedded in all their clothing, um, you know, uh, adds uh, would, would would makes it even more mysterious, uh, you know, because uh, you know once the clothes was all taken and 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 studied and looked at it you know it was found to have been irradiated it it, it had radiation embedded in the fabric yes uh, high levels this, high levels of radiation this was across this is pretty much uh, uh, all of the clothing if i do remember correctly yeah and and uh interesting enough uh there was a young boy who went to uh five of the victims funerals so i'm supposed uh he was related to some or, or knew the others or whatever and, you know, he noted that, uh, you know, all of their skin had this deep brown tan uh, that, again, was indicative of, uh, you know, radiation exposure. Um, and, I, I, you know, to, to reinforce the, you know, because, I mean, the first thing I, I guess us conspiracy nuts uh, think of when we're hearing radiation like that, and especially with, with just the way that th this whole thing unfolded, it was like, you know, UFO or extraterrestrial, right? I mean, they're the ones who we look to with the cattle mutilations, right? And here we have people who are uh, mutilated in a similar fashion, uh, you know, and they have radiation, which again uh, has been noted to show up in, in abduction cases and uh, sites where UFOs have been spotted. So, Crop circles and uh, and even in in particular uh, mutilation sites, yeah, uh, magnetic and uh, radioactive anomalies, and you know and and you know to reinforce this whole thing, you know apparently uh, you know there was these hikers about thirty two miles away, who had claimed that they seen these bright orange spheres of light in the sky right around, you know where this incident took place. Uh, you know, so we have the, these clothes that are exposed to radiation. You know, their their skin uh, has a look on it as if it's been exposed to radiation. And we have these lights that, you know, people have seen, uh, you know, around the area, which, again, you know, were strange and, you know, similar to what you hear of uh, with UFO sightings and stuff like that. So, I mean, all these things, to me... Uh, you know, that that's kind of where I, you know, I mean, that's the angle that I would lean in. Yeah, because they did, uh, 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 investigators did find a group of uh, hikers who were also on this, the same mountain in a different area. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's the that, ones I was just talking yeah, about. Yeah, and they, exactly, and they... they they were the ones who reported seeing uh, lights in the sky. I, I also uh, read a report um, from one of the surviving uh, uh, initial investigators. Oh, Yuri Yudin. Oh, no, uh, sorry, sorry. That's the, the... Or Yuri Yudin was one uh, the guy who who was part of the group but went back sick. Yeah, uh, this was one of the the uh, uh, one of the first responder uh, uh, rescuers, or you know, uh, search and rescuers. Anyways, uh, wasn't much of a rescue going on, um, but uh, he claimed uh, that that their their group had 
witness lights in the sky over the mountain themselves. Uh, now, this apparently wasn't for uh, uh, for year, you know years after uh, everything happened. Uh, it was the first time he spoke about it, but you know he did say that uh, you know when they were up there looking the first time they they did you know there was a a point where they seen strange lights in the sky. So it, it, it's not a uh, well in that area anyways. We have two different uh, 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 people, two different data points for lights in the sky. So uh, I guess that that pretty well establishes that that there was something seen there. Now whether it was related or not. Uh, I guess is part of the well, it's part of the mystery, right? You know, and and I guess that's where we, where we get into well, what what could it be? Uh, obviously, the first thing that pops into your mind is UFOs, extraterrestrials, uh, uh, some type of you know uh, uh, alien mutilation or, or well, human mutilation gone bad. Yeah, uh, well, like you know, to me, I mean, the most of most of the evidence would suggest. You know something extraterrestrial related to me, but there are other. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's multiple. You know, very different uh, theories that have have uh, been spoken about. Um, I mean, one of these was that, you know, these people were unknowingly victims of a secret military experiment. Uh, in fact, uh, Yuri Yudin, uh, the one survivor who uh, who of course didn't go on the trip. Uh, you know, he claims to have, uh, you know, seen a torn piece of fabric that resembled like a soldier's coat and a pair of glasses and skis, you know, because uh, he, he was up there looking over like the the stuff that were found by the investigators. And, you know, uh, so this fabric and glasses and skis were among the collected remains. And he claims that, you know, they weren't, you know, uh, belonging to any of his team members. And the fabric, you know, again, it looked like a soldier's coat. And uh, he also claims that he's seen documents that indicated that the investigation had actually begun two weeks before the campus uh, official discovery, um, which, you know, basically all, all things said, it indicates that the military had actually been up there before the, the first search team, which was the, the volunteering students and teachers, went up there. And, so, and ever found the, the tent or any of the bodies or anything like that. Yeah, and, and and Yuri even said that, you know, like, uh, and this was a quote, that there were special boxes with their organs sent for examination, but, you know, this was n uh, not noted in any of the papers that were released. So, I mean, uh, that makes me think of two things. I mean, yeah, you can look at it and say, uh, you know, the military was up there, and, you know, it's a military experiment, but personally... It would almost make more sense to me that if the military was up there, perhaps it was because, you know, they knew of these lights or, or extraterrestrial, you know, activity. Because the military has been known to go and, uh, you know, check check these things out when they happen, right? Uh So perhaps... Well, you know, and there, there, there was also the theory that... Uh, th they, you know, I had the 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 group had stumbled across uh, some some secret testing of a military weapon, and uh, you know, the one weapon that kept uh, coming up was was the um, people theorized that it was actually a, a, a thermobaric uh, uh, weapon that was being detonated. Uh, you know, thermobaric explosion is. Well, it's a it, it, it's unlike most other uh, uh, bombs. It's it's designed to uh, incinerate a an, an, a very large sphere of air, um, consume all the oxygen, and when what's left behind is a vacuum. Uh, so after the 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 conflagration and explosion, a massive pressure wave. That's the key factor. Is the, the only reason I really looked at the thermobaric uh, ex explosions is because they would actually explain a lot of the 
The fractures uh, and fractures and contusions. But one thing that uh, wasn't noted, because I looked specifically uh, through all the autopsies, that one thing that if it was a thermobaric explosion that you would have seen uh, would basically their 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 in, uh, their inner or, uh, ear bones and their eardrums and everything would have been destroyed. Um, and not to mention that you know if you're if you're any bit close to a thermobaric uh, explosion, it will it it, it could possibly pull the lungs right out of your mouth because uh, it creates a vacuum and suffocates you. <laughs> so I mean, uh, uh, all that considered, I mean, would they have even been able? I mean, if one of these things went off, I mean, uh, I'm just thinking like I mean they they took off out of their tent. Uh, so I mean, something would have to scare them out. If they were in the first explosion, while they're in their tent, they probably would have been dead already. Uh, you know, like, do you get what I'm saying? Like, uh, uh, oh yeah. Well, the the very nature of a thermobaric explosion is depending on how close you are to it. You could be far away enough from it that you don't actually experience the fireball. Uh, but the pressure wave, and then after the pressure wave, there's a uh, uh, the reverse of that uh, that you get hit with a pressure wave, and then uh, then there's a vacuum that 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 follows it, and it, it literally sucks all the air uh, out of your lungs if you're you're you know within the kill zone, and if you're right on the edge of the conflagration slash kill zone, uh, you know it, it could possibly. Uh, pull some of your insides out with the violence of the the vacuum and i guess some of the theories was that the the such a vacuum um would have or could have possibly yanked these people you know out of their tents and through the tents and scattered them down the hillside and all manner of you know <laughs> but looking at the autopsy reports and and specifically the the eardrums that's the that's the 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 that's the kicker. You would you would see their eardrums would have been blown out by the pressure waves at the very least. Yeah, uh, and I mean like that, that's the first to go. And the, there was other uh, theories that perhaps the uh, the military had used um, sound weapons in that you know I mean certain frequencies. Infrasound, are, yeah. Yeah, certain frequencies are known to uh, cause panic and anxiety and and otherwise cause you to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And the um, Russian government is actually uh, uh, very well known for using uh, ELFs, uh, extra low frequencies, and uh, um, well, there's ELFs and uh, there's there's extra low frequencies and uh, v, uh, VLFs, very low frequencies or something like that. Uh, but the, yeah, they they used what is it covered under the term infrasound to uh you know disturb the the internal chemistry of people's brains uh i guess the 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 in terms of the russians playing around with this uh one of the most famous cases was apparently they pointed uh one of these dishes at a uh, uh american embassy in russia um and over the next uh, several weeks uh they had you know uh, half of their staff go off on stress leave, you know, uh, and 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 this kind of thing, and leave the country. Uh, so it turned out uh, that it was a great success. Um, apparently, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, uh, even even all that being said, like uh, that only really would would take into account like the the scattering, you know, in the beginning of when they they took off outside of their tent. Um, you know, and there are a couple other theories, but, you know, these have considerably less uh, substantiated evidence. Actually, there, there's really nothing. It's just complete um, speculation. But, like, there's, um, you know, there's the, the idea that it, an avalanche somehow caused it, but it, it just, you know, I've never heard of an avalanche ripping someone's tongue out or their eyeballs. Um, <laughs> you know, and the other th is that... Uh, a Siberian Yeti, um, which is known to the locals over there as the Almas, had scared the group, you know, scrambling them up and out of their tent in the middle of the night. And, you know, perhaps, like, a, I mean, we don't know how strong Yetis are. Maybe the, a Yeti can hit like a car. Um, uh, well, they're, you know, at least in North America, they can reportedly uproot, uh, you know, young trees that are uh, five and six inches in diameter. Uh, and if any anybody who's... Uh, 
tried to pull a, uh, you know, even a small bush out of the ground. You know, good luck. Well, can you imagine being hunted by a Yeti on a, on a mountain in the middle of winter in a storm in the middle? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that'd, that'd be pretty freaky. Um, well, it, it would certainly be a apex predator in its, um, it, you know, in its natural habitat. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you'd be uh, big pretty trouble. much at its mercy. Yep. Um, but again, I, I'm more for the, the theory for the UFO with the, the radiation and the light, and and again, like the seemingly like cattle-like mutilations. Um, and of course, the last theory I came across was, uh, you know, the, the Mansi tribe that that's near there. You know, apparently don't like uh, people going on their territory. They could have hunted them, but again, it doesn't really add up to the types of. Uh, well, and specifically the the footprints that were found ar- around, uh, you know, was very clearly um, showed that there there was only you know they they counted nine people. I mean, there was trackers and and you know uh, um, all kinds of, of of very knowledgeable people who were up searching for these these poor nine individuals, uh, and they all said the same thing that you know there was the. There were distinctly tracks by 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 you know eight or nine different people, but but definitely no more than that. And you know there was no indication of um, you know groups of people uh, engaged in a, a you know in hand to hand combat. Um, <clears throat> there you know if anything it was just the the the, the, uh, the likelihood of just the two individuals uh, who had. Uh, engage one another in, in, in hand-to-hand combat. But aside from that, I mean, there's no indication that these people were, were uh, you know, you, you, uh, uh, distinctly, you know, what I was looking for in the autopsy reports uh, would be uh, a term like defensive injuries. Yeah. Um, you know, injuries that are sustained when somebody is trying to fend off an attack. Um, and and you really you, you you don't see that you you see you know remarks about strange cuts and contusions, um, but there's never any indication that you know the contusions appeared to to have been caused when the person was defending themselves from taking a blow or uh, or, or or something of that nature. That the randomness and the the overall violence of them. Um, seem to indicate something entirely different you know and what what really got me uh was the uh, uh the the term uh that the official term that was used um did you come across that uh what what, what uh, that they they the military uh in 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 particular, they specifically said uh, that it was, you know, uh, it, it, when it was all said and done, that the event was caused uh, by a, uh, you know, an, an unknown force uh, of, of... Oh, yes. I can't remember the exact wording, but yeah, it, it was something, yeah, it was, it was extremely abnormal. Um, I can't remember the wording that they used, but I mean, uh, they even shut, like, barred off that area like they they shut that area off from anyone going there for like three years right uh uh it was just off limits like the whole thing was was nobody could explain it i mean uh frankly it it seemed as if everyone involved was pretty spooked by it um nobody could ever explain it i mean it's still a mystery and of course the the area now uh is called the ditlov pass uh Named yeah, after named, the uh, yeah exactly the leader of the 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 failed expedition. So yeah, I mean, uh, well, that's our story. Um, I I really highly suggest uh, uh, you know anybody who's interested in it, to to go check out that you know one of my source links that I use because it, it was very uh, uh, you know it was very um, thorough. Uh, and if you want to go there, just go to www.ermaktravel.com, and you should be able to find it under like Europe, Russia. I'm just looking at the slashes here now, and then it starts getting into the uh, all kinds of symbols. So I'm not going to read that out. <laughs> but yeah, you should be able to navigate your way there. I think from there. Um, other than that, uh, we have 
quite a few other interesting st- uh, stories that we're, we're hoping to get out uh, over the holidays. And even though we're not going to tell you who, we may have a very interesting guest um, in the not-too-distant future. At least right now, it's scheduled in. Um, so I'm not going to say it until it happens. But uh, you should be on the lookout for that. I believe it's January 8th. Yes, that's correct. That's right. Okay. So, and again, if if you guys have uh, stories or, or topics that you know you want us to discuss on uh, d- our podcast, or, or you have pictures or videos you want us to look at, you can send them to will at fdupstories dot com or Ryan at fdupstories dot com. And keep in mind that uh, we're very much uh, expanding on the site to offer new features. All of our podcasts are there. Um, and we're looking at ways to improve and, and make the site more uh, interesting for you guys. So be sure to check the official site at www.fdupstories.com. That's E-F-F-E-D-U-P-S-T-O-R-I-E-S.com. And again, if you want us to have more interesting guests, more you know, more uh, content, more of everything, help us build our uh, subscriber base you know, get your friends, your family, spread the word, put it on the forums, on uh, blogs, you know, just get it out there, recommend it, share it. And uh, if you really want to move this quickly, go to our official site and uh, donate anything through PayPal. And all of the money that gets donated will be funneled back into the uh, podcast, either in the form of advertising or just something that we think will... Um, bring in a, a larger audience and hopefully we'll be able to expand and give you more of what you want. And for those of you out there who m- might be, you know, thinking about the story and saying, ah, you know, it's obviously it was just uh, something bad that happened. There's no, no big deal. Uh, the, the, uh, the very last uh, uh, statement made by the investigators, the cause of death uh, by a quote unquote, a quote unquote compelling unknown force. That's the quote. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, stay tuned for more episodes during the holidays and soon after. I'm your host, Will Pender, signing off, and I am your co-host, Ryan Sharp. Good night, everybody. <laughs>